Hi everybody, in this video we're going to explore some of the research methods that scientists use to uh, evaluate brain and behavior relationships. So first let's start with neuroanatomy. This is the, the study of the structure of the brain and the rest of the, the nervous system, the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves and so forth. One way that we can do this is with gross neuroanatomy. This is focusing on general structures and connections, these things that you can see with the naked eye. You might also call it macroanatomy or macro neuroanatomy. This is what we've been doing in the lab using the sheep brains. You can actually learn a lot from gross neuroanatomy, um, but we can learn even more from studying the microscopic structure of the brain and other nervous tissues. So microscopic neuroanatomy focuses on the more detailed structures, things you need a microscope to see. Histology is typically the term that we use for this field. This is the study of microscopic tissue structures through dissection and staining techniques. This term refers to the microscopic study of all different tissues, not just brain tissue. Uh, but of course, we're most interested in how brain tissue is studied here. One of the chief tools used in histology is the use of stains. These are special chemicals that provide visual contrast that allows you to highlight specific features within the tissues that you're studying. Oftentimes it's difficult to discriminate one uh, type of cell from another or parts within a cell from one another. Uh, there's a not, not a lot of uh, contrast that occurs naturally when you're looking at slides of thinly sliced tissue. Uh, but stains allow you to really highlight specific aspects of the tissues that you're studying. One type of stain we've already talked about is the Golgi stain, or the silver impregnation method developed by Camilo Golgi and used to great effect by him and by Santiago Romón y Cajal. Here you're seeing uh, different sections of human cortex. So this is a piece of parietal cortex, and this is what's called a vertical slice, so that's going from the, su the surface of the cortex down to the white matter, gray matter boundary here. And uh, you can see that there are sort of stripes, there's banding patterns here, and that these banding patterns differ from one patch of cortex to the next. So for example, striate cortex, this is also known as area 17, and it's functionally its primary visual cortex. You can see that striate cortex has this extra deep stripe or striation uh, in the deeper layers. That's why it's called striate cortex. Motor cortex has uh, sort of a, a different structure. It sort of has upper and deep layers without this, this dark band in the middle layers. This is showing you the border between two cortical regions. This is area 17, the one with that stripe in the deep layers, you can see it ending right here. So this is the junction between area 17 and what's called area 18. These are different cortical regions or cortical fields. And this is one way we can use staining to reveal the structure of the nervous systems by seeing uh, how structures differ from one place to another at the microscopic level. An early histologist named Brodman developed a really comprehensive map of the human cerebral cortex doing exactly this kind of work. So carefully examining patches of human cortex to look for areas where they differ. And he identified well over 40 uh, different discrete areas in the human cortex. So these are histologically or cytoarchitectonically distinct regions. Cyto means cell, so the, the architecture of these plates, tectonics, uh, varies from one region of cortex to another. We still use these areas when uh, describing the locations of the, our research on the human cortex. Another very important kind of stain that histologists use uh, and neuroscientists in general use are called tracers. So these are stains that reveal connectivity. They show how neurons are connected to one another. Mainly, they show the paths of white matter. They show the paths of axons through the brain and the rest of the nervous system. There are two main classes of stains. Those are anterior grade and retrograde. Anterior grade stains are taken up by, they're chemicals that are taken up by the dendrites in the soma, wherever they're injected in the brain, and then transported along the axons, all the way along the axon, as far as it, it extends, to the axon terminals, 
the presynaptic terminals on the very end of the axon. Anti, of course, means going forward. So these anterior grade tracers move along in the same direction as the action potential. But of course, they're, very, they're carried very slowly over the course of days. Retrograde tracers, on the other hand, are taken up by the axon terminals at the end of the axon and transported backward to the soma and dendrites. So retro means backward. So these are carried in the opposite direction of the action potential. Now these tracers are only used in animal research because uh, in order to see where the tracers ended up, in order to trace these pathways, you have to sacrifice the research subject that you're, uh, you're working with. So this isn't something that's done with humans. It's only done in animal research. This is just one example. So for example, in this previous slide here, you can see the early visual pathway. Light strikes the retina. It's converted into a pattern of action potentials that are carried along the axons that make up the op optic nerve. The optic nerve uh, has axons that make a synapse with neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, which we saw in the sheep brain, the LGN for short. The axons coming from those cell bodies, those somas that make up the LGN, become the optic radiations here, and then transfer that signal back to primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. This is also area 17, or striate cortex, which we just saw on the previous slide. So if I were to inject an anterior grade tracer in the lateral geniculate nucleus, where do you think you would find it? So I inject it into the lateral geniculate nucleus. It's an anterior grade tracer. I wait a couple of days. I sacrifice the, uh, the subject. Where do you think I'd find it? If you guessed primary visual cortex, you'd be right. So the action poten potentials mostly travel from the LGN to the primary visual cortex, carrying visual information back to this area of the brain where it gets processed further. On the other hand, if I were to inject a retrograde tracer here, it would be taken up by the synaptic terminals, by the presynaptic terminals, and carried backward along the axons that make up the optic nerve back to their cell bodies, which live all throughout the retina. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. So this is a lower, low power image of a rat's retina. And this is a, a higher resolution image. So here we've zoomed in a bit on the rat's retina. It's cut here because, of course, it's sort of a half sphere shape on the back of the eye. And they flattened it out, so they need to make some cuts. But if you zoom in, you can see what are called ganglion cells within the rat's retina. So here, a retrograde tracer called HRP, or horseradish peroxidase, was injected into the rat's lateral geniculate nucleus. You wait a couple of days for the HRP stain to get transported backward uh, along the axons from the LGN back to the retina, and then you see it here. So that HRP has stained the cell bodies, the somas and dendrites, in the rat's retina. The axons coming off these cells normally carry visual information from the retina back to the lateral geniculate nucleus. We can create immensely complex maps of cortical connectivity and brain connectivity in general using these methods. So this is showing you a lateral view of a macaque monkey's uh, brain. All the colored in areas here are visual areas. These are patches of cortex that respond to visual stimuli. And here's a, a mid-sagittal section showing, showing you the structures on the, uh, the medial wall that also respond to vision. And of course, here's the animal's eye. If we flatten out the macaque's cortex, it would look something like this. And again, you can see the visual areas colored in different colors. One thing to note is that you can see about a third or more of this monkey's brain is devoted to vision. That's about the same for us. Primates in general tend to be very visual animals. We rely heavily on visual input. At any rate, each of these visual areas, we'll learn later, contains its own retinotopic map, sort of a uh, representation of the image that's striking your retina at any moment. This is showing you a wiring diagram of each of those visual areas. So for example, this red one here is area MT, uh, which you'd find right about in here. 
And each one of these differently colored areas is represented by a box over here. Each one of these lines represents reciprocal con connections, axons, allowing two visual areas to communicate. So, for example, you can see that V3, uh, which is right in here, projects to uh, posterior intraparietal area. So you can see these visual areas are massively interconnected. But they're actually not exhaustively interconnected. Not er every visual area connects with every other one. So these sort of maps constrain our uh, model of how information is processed in the brain. They tell us how information flows from one part of the brain to another, and they can inform our ideas about how information is represented and stored and processed in the brain. Immunohistochemistry or immunocytochemistry is another really important tool for understanding the, the microscopic structure of, of the brain. Specifically, it's, it's used for uh, identifying the distribution of proteins in the brain. So certain proteins are only expressed in certain types of cells or under certain conditions. And we can use these tools to figure out where those proteins are being expressed. And as a result, ident identify only certain types of cells and where they are in the brain. Um, it involves using antibodies. So antibodies are your immune system's natural way of tagging foreign proteins uh, in order for your immune system to attack foreign invading cells like bacteria or cells that have been infected with a virus. But we can exploit that machinery to label certain proteins inside your cells or on the surface of your cells with fluorescent chemicals, fluorescent stains. And as a result, you can come up with maps like this. So in this animal here, this is a coronal section through the brain of a rat. And on the right, it shows a rat that had a sort of intentional stroke. They gave the rat something like a stroke, blocked off blood flow to part of its brain, just like in a stroke in humans. And the cells in green here are expressing an enzyme called capsase. Uh, this is a, a protease mediator of apoptosis, which doesn't mean anything to you yet, but it will. It's an enzyme, a protein, that breaks down other proteins when cells kill themselves on purpose, when they intentionally commit suicide. And that's what's going on here. So these cells are in the process of dying now. Okay, this video shows a, uh, a remarkable new method for visualizing the results of immunohistochemical or immunocytochemical studies. We're heading, We're heading into the center of a mouse's, mouse's brain, brain, into the hippocampus where memories are formed. So this is the cortex of this animal's brain. These are the cell bodies. These are apical dendrites. These are actually pyramidal cells in the cortex. This is the work of Carl Dyseroff and his team at Stanford University. By making the entire brain transparent, they were able to image it using a light microscope. They call the new technique clarity. Existing techniques for studying the brain's wiring are often limited to looking at very small volumes of brain, or they don't allow you to label genes or chemicals of interest. The advantage of clarity is that you can label lots of molecules in whole brains. So how do you make the brain transparent? The thing that obscures the view is fat. Lipid layers surround each cell. To remove them without disrupting the cell structure, the team used a hydrogel to create a mesh to hold the rest of the components in place. Then they could clear away the fat. This is a mouse brain before and after. The brain, is now the brain is now transparent to light, to light but it's also permeable, also permeable to molecules, which means scientists can add molecular, molecular markers to highlight, markers to highlight just as So this is where the immunocytochemistry comes in. Uh, here they're labeling different types of proteins with uh, fluorescent dyes of different colors. So you can see the distribution of different cell types or different proteins within the brain. <laughs> 
And you can see here that you can overlap several of these maps to really get a rich representation of the different types of cells and their distribution in the brain. One millimeter block of hippocampus, excitatory neurons are green, inhibitory neurons are red, and cells called astrocytes are blue. The technique works in human brains too. This is a chunk of the frontal lobe of a seven year old boy who had autism. It's possible, it's possible to trace the path, the path of a single nerve projection, projection through a forest, through a forest, of, other forest of other cells. When the team looked when closely, closely in one, in one cortex, layer of the cortex, they noticed ladder-like ladder -like patterns where neurons had connected back to themselves and to other neurons. Similar abnormal structures have been seen in animals with autism-like behaviors. Being able to analyze brain structures like this and match them up with molecular information could help neuroscientists uncover how changes to the brain underlie disease. Most of the research that we're going to be talking about this semester is going to fall into the category of neurophysiology. This is sort of a broad term to describe any kind of method that measures or manipulates brain activity. One way to do this is with electrical stimulation. So if you look at this little cartoon here, the caption says, whoa, that was a good one. Try it, Hobbs. Just poke his brain right where my finger is. Now, poking the brain wouldn't actually do this, but if you had a, a patient with its, his skull open, or her skull open and stimulated electrically, you can actually uh, cause parts of the body to move involuntarily. And that's what's shown here. So we've explored this already a little bit, but this is a somatotopic map along the motor cortex and along somatosensory cortex. So when different parts of cortex here are stimulated electrically, you get movements in different parts of the body. Here, when you stimulate different parts of cortex, you get uh, a sensation of being touched in different parts of the body. This is somatosensory cortex. This is just behind the central sulcus here in the parietal lobe. And then here's primary motor cortex, which is just anterior, just before the central sulcus in the frontal lobe. One way that this is done is using subdural microelectrode recording. So these are tiny pieces of metal uh, embedded in a sheet, plastic sheet, that's then implanted underneath the dura mater, so subdural, right on the surface of the cortex. This is done in human patients who are getting ready to undergo surgery to relieve their epilepsy. For certain types of epilepsy, uh, the seizure only starts in one part of the brain. And if the patient isn't responding well to medication, sometimes the best course of action is actually to go in and cut out the little chunk of brain tissue that's always generating the seizures. But before you do that, you want to make very sure that you know exactly which part of the brain is generating the seizures. And you want, also want to make very sure that that part of the brain isn't doing something very specific that can't be replaced if it were to be taken out. And this is typically done with these indwelling electrodes. So you'll bring in a, an epilepsy patient and have them hang out in the hospital for a week or so with these uh, electrodes implanted and just wait for a seizure. They're taken off their meds. But while they're waiting, they're often asked to, uh, to be a volunteer for research that's going on. And they might be shown pictures or asked to perform some kind of task. And you can get very good recordings of the electrical activity generated by the brain in here. But you can also stimulate different parts of the brain. We'll see a video of this a little later in the semester. Someone whose face perception area was stimulated using these indwelling electrodes and whose face perception was altered as a result of that activity temporarily. So for example, you might send a weak electric current between these two electrodes and then you would temporarily disrupt whatever activity was going on in the chunk of tissue between those two. And in that way, you can help map out the brain functionally and figure out what parts of the brain do what.
but probably by far the most commonly used method of uh, neurophysiological recording is the single cell recording technique, also called the single unit recording technique. Typically this is done in animals. Very rarely is it done in humans. Again, only in the circumstances that I just mentioned where you've got an epileptic patient getting ready to undergo surgery. In some cases they, they'll use depth electrodes that go not on the cortex but into the brain and those can sometimes record from single neurons. But in animals this is done routinely. It works something like this. So you, you'll have let's say a monkey and you've trained up the monkey to perform some kind of a task. So for example this monkey has been trained to keep its eyes fixated right on this dot and not move its eyes at all. And it's been trained to discriminate uh, shapes or objects that appear in its visual field. Once the monkey's been trained up on the task, uh, then you would implant the electrodes into the part of the brain that you're interested in studying. So oftentimes when you're studying the visual cortex, you would implant the electrode into some part of visual cortex. And then it turns out each neuron represents a particular part of the visual field called the receptive field. So here they're recording from a single neuron, and this is that cell's receptive field. So now you can present different types of stimuli inside the cell's receptive field and figure out what that cell responds to. And you can also see how its activity changes depending on what the monkey's doing. For example, what it's paying attention to or uh, what it's been trained to remember. Optogenetics is another very new and very powerful technique uh, that involves stimulating neurons with light after they've been genetically altered to become responsive to light. So the first step is to use a virus which has been specially constructed to contain a gene that you'd like the neurons in the animal that you're studying to possess. In this case, for example, they've got a gene that encodes a protein that's sensitive to light. It's actually a light-sensitive sodium channel. So when certain wavelengths of light strike this protein, when it's embedded on the, the surface of the cell in the membrane, the, uh, the, the ion channel, the sodium channel, opens up and depolarizes the cell, as shown here. But first you've got to have that gene inside the neuron, and it's got to be expressed in the neuron. In other words, uh, the protein that the gene codes for has to be created by the cell. So you insert that construct into a virus. Viruses, many of them, sort of hijack your cell's machinery in order to make copies of themselves. They're generally not able to make copies of themselves alone. They invade your cells and use your cellular machinery to do that. But we can sort of hijack the virus in order to get genes that we want into cells. So you would inject that virus into the animal's brain, typically into a specific part of the brain that you're interested in studying, and the opsin gene is then expressed in specific neurons. Then step four, you would insert an optrode, a fiber optic cable plus a regular old metal electrode to record voltage changes. Then you can use that fiber optic cable to send in certain wavelengths of light to then at will create action potentials in specific neurons. This is showing you a close-up of one of those optrodes. So these little metal pieces here are the microelectrodes and then in the middle is the optic fiber. You can also use light to shut off cells. So in the case that I've just mentioned, light will turn on the cells. In this case, they've introduced a protein that causes the cell to cease having action potentials when the light is shown in, the light at 532 nanometers wavelength. So this is showing you the recording from the electrode. You can see action potentials periodically. But then for this period of time when the light is being shown on this neuron, it stops firing. So you essentially shut off the neuron. And then when you shut off the light, the neuron starts functioning regularly again.